It finally happened. NASA's Artemis 1 mission has successfully launched from Florida's famous launch pad 39B, which has previously hosted launches for Apollo and the space shuttles, amongst many others. And Artemis is now heading for the moon. It managed this despite many delays, damage caused when it sat through a hurricane, and even the deployment of the so-called red team to the pad just before liftoff. November 16th, 2022 was the day that it finally happened after several delays. And at a very early time that forced me out of bed, the 100 meter tall rocket took to the sky. It's an impressive machine that's two meters taller than London's Big Ben. And for now, it's the most powerful rocket to ever launch. It also does look very similar to the Saturn V rockets that launched the Apollo missions to the moon, which is either a beautiful callback that fills you with joy, or NASA reusing an old design despite 50 years passing, depending on your opinion of the agency. The mission paves the way for humans to return to the lunar surface, and the Artemis program will land the first woman and first person of color on the moon. This mission will orbit the moon with no one on board. The next will take astronauts on that same journey, and Artemis 3 will land near the south pole of the moon. That is slightly different to the half dozen Apollo missions that all landed closer to the equator and holds more prospects for finding interesting things like evidence of water on the moon. The launch wasn't all plain sailing though. As you might guess by this point, another leak was detected during fueling. Luckily, this leak wasn't in the rocket itself, but was related to the ground support equipment. While they did have to stop the flow of liquid hydrogen to the core stage of the rocket and delayed launch by about 40 minutes, the day was saved by the deployment of the Red Crew. This is a mythical sounding team of people that are specially trained to physically go out to a loaded rocket, usually a place that's very off limits, and perform small repairs. In this case, the job was basically to tighten some nuts at the base of the mobile launcher. It worked a treat and the countdown could resume. Success was also achieved despite damage done to the rocket during a hurricane. Just a week or so before launch, Hurricane Nicole hit Florida but the decision was made to leave Artemis 1 on the launch pad where it was awaiting launch. They did this because the storm was predicted to be weak enough that Artemis should be fine. However, the storm strengthened and sustained winds of 80 miles an hour and gusts up to 100 miles an hour battered the rocket. This was more than it was designed to take and while it was mostly fine, there was a bit of damage. This damage was mostly to layers of insulation that coat the rocket. You can see here the damaged section, where a piece of insulation 10 feet in length and a fifth of an inch thick peeled off of the rocket. NASA did not have access to fix this on the pad, but they concluded that even if the piece became liberated during launch, it shouldn't damage any critical components. To be fair, all of this turned out to be correct, and things from here have gone very well. Liftoff was excellent, and 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust sent Artemis 1 into the morning Florida sky. As the launch continued, and remember this is the first ever launch of NASA's new space launch system, the SLS. All of the right things happened and the parts of the rocket that had done their jobs were shedded to help the spacecraft stay lean as it blasted into space. Two minutes after liftoff, the first parts to be sent packing are the solid rocket boosters. These burn six tons of fuel each second and provide most of the thrust to get off the ground. The issue with rockets is you need a lot of fuel to launch the important bits, like the astronauts. But then you need more fuel to launch the fuel, and then more fuel to launch that fuel, and so on. That's why a lot of what is ejected is empty fuel tanks that have served their purpose emptied themselves and are no longer needed. This top part, by the way, the spiky bit, is basically how we would get astronauts out of there if it all went wrong. If it detects a serious enough problem, it suddenly accelerates away from the rocket very fast, hopefully pulling astronauts fast enough to escape any danger. They'd then safely float down with a parachute. The orange part is the core stage of the rocket. This is basically an enormous fuel tank filled with mostly liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, which is about minus 180 degrees Celsius. And it has four RS-25 rockets on the bottom, each recycled from previous space shuttle launches. In eight minutes, this core stage burnt approximately two million liters of fuel, equivalent to the volume of an Olympic swimming pool. And then it too fell away from the most precious part of the rocket. That most precious part is the Orion module including the place where astronauts will sit in future launches. This part is attached to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, 
which accelerates Orion around the Earth, slingshotting it towards the Moon in what's called a translunar injection. Once Orion is en route to the Moon, this ICPS detaches from Orion and sends itself to orbit the Sun for pretty much the rest of time. Orion itself is then made of two parts, the astronaut capsule and the service module, which together are about eight meters long. The European Space Agency ESA actually built the service module for NASA, and it contains the guidance systems and thrusters to help Orion maneuver. The capsule above that can fit up to four astronauts for up to 21 days, in a space about the size of a medium-sized camper van. All of Orion then journeys to the moon, does about one and a half orbits and then 25 days after launch. The command module will detach from the service module and be the only part of the rocket to splash back down in the Pacific Ocean. Hopefully in a way that means potential passengers will survive the same thing next time we do all of this. This first mission is longer than the 21 days that astronauts can stay in the capsule, so that we can really push the hardware to its limits and see how it behaves over as long a time as possible. Also, Orion itself will never land on the moon. It's not designed to do that. The lander used on future missions will be built by SpaceX, and astronauts will transfer between the crafts while orbiting the moon, likely using the proposed lunar gateway that I mentioned in this previous video. SpaceX will also share the burden of getting astronauts to the moon, starting from the Artemis 4 missions that will follow this first moon landing. Their rocket is called Starship, and will be completely reusable and way cheaper to use than the SLS. So it actually is likely to completely replace SLS eventually, if you ask me that is. Starship, if its tests go well, could well surpass SLS pretty quickly and make it a bit obsolete and will definitely be the new most powerful rocket once it is operational. So let me know your thoughts on all of this down below. Are you excited to see these new moon missions? Do you think Starship will completely outclass the SLS? And would you go to the moon if you had the chance? I'll keep you up to date with all of the developments of Artemis and all things space right here. So subscribe if you haven't yet, and I'll catch you on the next one. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye. I give you a go to resume count and launch Artemis 1. Four stage engine start. Three, two, one. Boosters and ignition. And lift off of Artemis 1. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. SLS now traveling 607 miles per hour. The harder the climb, the better the view.